dear pure urology facebook viewers good evening one and all today our topic is related to rirs as you all know retrograde intraarterial surgery in 1990 has come in us and then in uh, other western countries by the time it came india it is 1994 uh, 5 uh, 2004 uh, 5 like that and uh, 2007 8 there are only two three uh, urologists were doing at that time a uh, lot of the uh, seniors uh, were saying that uh, this will take a lot of time invasive causes infection only few can do it that means an art art is good for the any other any profession but not may not be in medical profession if it is not converted into science that's what actually today's speaker is dr rohit joshi he himself suggested the topic i understood what it means an art is very good in any profession but in medical profession when we deal with the patients if it does not turn, turn out to be science then it is useless so many people have done many artistic surgeries and they may not have survived so this surgery after 2009 like uh, dr kandasamy sir uh, like dr uh, kandarp sir dr uh, prabhakaran and after that myself we have started and now second generation very good surgeons have evolved in which uh, today speaker uh, rohit joshi is one youngster who has picked up and practiced many years and he might be accepting today in the discussion apart from his technical point we will discuss because this is primarily focused on surgical technique we accept that lot of juniors are able to learn it they are not breaking the scopes as frequently as they are fortunately the digital scopes have come with lesser cost and fortunately patients are also getting benefited maximum with the putting of stent before if you have any problem so it is converting into science that's what uh, probably he means let me listen from him uh, dr rohit uh, i thank once again for accepting the invitation good evening good evening yeah so i wanted to briefly ask because i have seen you first time in ahmedabad when uh, two three conferences ahmedabad is like uh, a hub of conferences sharing knowledge and integrity ahmedabad urology society and west zone urology society like any other urology society a lot of integrity particularly in ahmedabad all the urologists come uh, greet and then he you were conducting uh, the entire program for two days uh, for kandar parik sir and other conferences also you are a good speaker you have sense of humor and you evolved yourself uh, with good surgeries like hole para rs and for all these uh, uh, before i ask you surgical mentor which uh, age of you in your life you are accepted to go with the people easily and then made you yourself mature and uh, what what education helped you see basically i am an ikb rc alumni i did my uh, urology residency from institute of kidney disease and research center and uh, dr shailesha was my pg teacher and then subsequently i had uh, a uh, lot of mentors and i keep learning i never think i have learned enough because you know the day i feel i have learned enough i'll probably stop growing and i will probably stop learning so i am still evolving i am still evolving as a surgeon i am still evolving as a urologist i'll still am evolving even as a human being so i'll keep myself always uh, you know in a kind of a, a bracket like a student who always uh, has you know zeal to learn and uh, be the best uh, version of myself so i'll keep learning all my life When did you and start RIRS and who is your mentor in RIRS? Uh, to be very honest, 2011 was you know the year when we had uh, installed the first uh, one of the first 100 watt Holmian laser in our hospital. Uh, it was probably first of uh, entire Gujarat state. Uh, in addition to one other in IKDRC, and subsequently we picked up a Holmian laser in education as well as RIRS. But you know, is uh, you know we are in uh, private practice, so. uh handling two three hospitals at one point of time i never had you know that much of time to you know publish myself and for to present myself and then gradually you know as the, you know you also know it takes a lot of time for you know organization to you know run on an auto mode so the, the day we i saw that thing happening with my own private practice then gradually i found the decision to it and then gradually i started presenting and publishing so this is a this is a process which started way back in 2011 and uh, yeah and here i am very good i am very happy uh, for that so for the audience uh, because he is doing first time in pure it is a video based surgical presentation or as an art or science don't misunderstand the statement it has a lot of meaning and uh, let us listen uh, 
uh, from Dr. Rohit Joshi, who did uh, uh, the urology from IKD, which is a prestigious institute, Chairman Ash Aparna Super Speciality Hospital, Parima Ahmedabad, and also Director of Eurocare Associates, Aparna Super Speciality Hospital, Ahmedabad, Managing Trustee Ash Foundation Charitable Trust, Ahmedabad, Area of Practice, Endourology, Laser Urology, Uro-Oncology, and most of it. Honorary Resident of uh, now West Zone Chapter of Urology Society of India, 2022-2024. Founder Council Member of U, Youth uh, Urology, which is a very significant group now in the Indian segment of Urology Society of India. Engage urologists to have homium 100 watts laser and have done more than 750 procedures on Global Planner for Luminous Whole Lab Training Program as mentor. He also published uh, case reports, uh, IJU, uh, one anterior diverticulum, one vaginal metastasis of RCC, one urotrochelicostomy, complex UPG structure. And also he is uh, involved in the Indian guidelines uh, of Urology Society of India in management of benign prostatic hyperplasia. This is the way anxious evolve and over a period of time papers also will come and they will also uh, uh, share for the science uh, more, more, more in future. With this introduction, uh, I, I request uh, uh, Rohit to talk about the RIRS, how he learned, what are the basics and safety for the patient, how it is evolving uh, as science. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chandra, for the kind introduction. Uh, at the outset, let me express my sincere gratitude to you, especially who have you know been instrumental in a loving uh, young generation. I was you know call myself a second generation. I would have to call you uncle, but you know thank you so much for you know allowing people like us to you know be a part of the uh, very very esteemed panel as you are. Where you know the faculties before me have been nothing less than galaxies. So I really feel proud about it and. Uh, uh, let me go back to, let me, you know, start my presentation. And yes, you correctly pointed it out that, uh, you know, it's, uh, whenever we talk about RIRS, there is a difference whether it's an art or science. So this is the topic which I'm going to discuss in the next 20, 25 minutes with your new permission, Chandra. Shall I go ahead? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, yeah. So I have nothing to disclose, no conflict of interest as far as financial thing is concerned. But yes, I have a huge... Uh, Disclosure closer because you know I am you know uh, in a friendly terms with Radni Kant of South Zone. That's nothing less than Chandra Mohan. And you know in the same way I'll I'll take this privilege you know call myself somebody as uh, as brilliant as Samita Bachchan. So you know our friendship goes a long way. Whether it was a part of any conference, any workshops, whether it was at your home singing songs with your wife, my baby, or having uh, Allah time at your home or at my home. So these are the memories which you make out of this uh, you know, friendship. Urology is just a side of this. So I, I, I cherish our friendship and we see long term into this. Uh, let's you know get serious about the, the topic, the fact files, which I need to you know uh, throw at you. Enough of sweet talk, let's have some bitter talk. We Indians are arguably the best perk surgeons. We all agree to that. Flexible URIs was invented not by choice, but by lack of choice. This statement really needs a great understanding because you know the the you are a flexible URS in the countries where it was invented, people were not that good in doing particular surgery. So they had to invent uh, by lack of choice. But we Indians are unarguably the best ones in the world who can reproduce or replicate anything that comes from the West. We always ape them and we feel proud in epic them. But whatever we have said, RIRS is here to stay because there are two kind of different reasons for RIRS to be here to stay. One is uh, ethically, it is you know there in every urine basis guidelines, whether it's AUA guideline or EA guideline. And yeah, definitely it has uh, distinct advantages for the patients, provided they are selected carefully. And there are some uh, questionable uh, kind of you know reasons also why RIRS is going to be here because. It's a huge marketing drive by industry players because if you buy a rigid nephroscope and do 1000 PCNL, you never will have to you know, go back to the same vendor. But if you do the same thing for the flexible URS or RIRS, you will have to at least go back to him 10, 20 times you know, to purchase recurrent things. Uh, but it has been made cost effective in for Indian market and that is the game changer. Since then, RIRS has been picked up a lot in Indian market. And you know, there are a few RIRS surgeons who are not very good at core skills and they promote RIRS right and left. So these are certain you know, questionable reasons why RIRS is going to be here. And might well even there are general surgeons who are doing a very good RIRS who can never do a PCM. So let us ask this question to ourselves. Is it an art or science? I personally feel it is 
nothing less than a common sense. And I have reasons for that. I'll take next 15 minutes in convincing you for my answer. Uh, first of all, let me tell you for me, RRS is nothing but an extension of URS. And the URS is the most commonly performed procedure even during a residency phase. And by performing so many URSs, we already have developed a sixth sense about the unit being friendly or compliant, accommodative or non-accommodative, and especially about those curves and kinks that come across our way. So RIRS is natural extension of URS. And in RIRS, you know, we are blessed that we do what we see. And if we don't do, if we can't see, you can never take a case of one and say, oh no, the prostate was very huge. I cannot do it, so we'll do it next stage. In PCNL, we can never say that, that uh, there was no hydronephrosis, I could not puncture, so I'll not do it this way. But in RIRS, we can do that, uh, passing on all the run to the patient's anatomy that your ureter was not accommodative, and we'll stage it, and you might have to do a different modality, or you might have to do it at a different setting. So that's how RIRS is very friendly to any urologist with the basic background skills of URS. So that is what is the common sense because we have done commonly performed URS and we have developed sense about uh, extending that URS, which is fiber of uh, semi-rigid to fiber of the condition flexible URS. Having said that, we can't just jump into it. We need to follow 10 commandments. I have decided to uh, you know, fragment this talk in 10 commandments. So if you follow all these uh, you know, 10 golden rules, then probably your journey to RSS would be very smooth with a very uh, you know, uncomplicated way. Let us talk it one by one. We all know for any surgery, we need to know the anatomy. And here the anatomy is, you know, to be considered in endoscopic way. Because what we come across in endoscopy is, you know, curls. And these curls deserve attention in all respect. Yeah? And the curls are beautiful. There are good streets like this. There are different ways, different curls which can attract a man. And at times, there are dangerous curls ahead. So it's not always that the curves are beautiful. So we need to use our common sense in negotiating those curves. Now, what kind of curves come across as in uh, RIRS? Now, I see there are two kinds of curves. Number one is a urethral curve, and number two is a urethral curve. Let's know one by one about each of them. Now, this urethral curve happens exclusively in male patients. So whenever you know, get trying to pass a guide wire and then uh, negotiating the urethral access sheath, or those who are not using sheaths, when they try to backlog their uh, flexible URS, they find this curve very, very difficult because whenever you, you try to push it further, you know, there is a band which happens and that creates a lot of problem. At times the guide bar slips every time into the weather and you cannot succeed in placing an excess sheet. So what are the solution? One can leave a DJ stand for an interval or RIRS later on, which is no scientific uh, support. Or uh, my friend Chandra does that. He uses a 28 centimeter pediatric urethral sheet and uh, which frankly fits inside this 4.9 French URS. And we can just negotiate a traverse and the meters, and then we can uh, use this as an assembly and uh, slide the unit like sheet up across the UV junction and uh, negotiate the curve. But this requires, you know, dedicated uh, kind of you know, scopes and all assembly. At, at, times, at times, you know, you can have a shearing effect in the ureter. So my solution is using a 21 French VIO sheet. We all have this VIO sheet. And the logically, if the problem of curve is at urethral level, let us treat it at the urethral level. Why you need to have a URS for that? So this is the assembly we all have in our career. This is 21 French sheet through which this excess sheet goes, whichever size you want to use. Yes. Right. Uh, Rohit, you rejoin if you have this issue. Call you. So for the audience, uh, whenever there is break, if it is related to my subject, I will also share my knowledge. Urethra, honestly speaking, in the present era of uh, uh, the structure, you should know how the urethra is. So if you don't are urethra, if you don't is rejoining so if you don't assess the urethra you may damage so directly going with the access sheet sometimes uh, you may come across stricture especially if it is long segment stricture post operatively patient may blame you 
So like urethroscopy, you also do urethroscopy once with 17 French uh, cystoscope, you will be same. Same, he was mentioning that if it is VAU, you can pass a guide wire and then remove the outer sheath and then pass the, he is come back. So he will share the screen and uh, we'll, we'll be back. Sorry for the inconvenience. Apologies for this uh, bad connectivity. Yeah, yeah, no problem. It happens in one hour, yeah, one yeah. while. No problem. You can, can share the screen. Can you, can, you see, can you see my slides? No, no, no. You have not shared it. Okay, I'll share, share it once again. Yeah, it is sharing now. And you have come back to the yeah. uh, same uh, maneuvering urethral curve. Yes, right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So what we do is, like, see, we pass this 21 French uh, uh, VIO sheet, and then through that sheet, we pass a URS, which can be either 6 by 7.5. And then we bypass the sensor guide wire across the duratic orifice. And then we backlog that uh, with the whichever excess sheet. And either we have two options, either we keep that 21 French uh, uh, sheet inside or we can take that sheet, keeping just the half full uh, sheet intact so that you can have, you know, luxury at the urethral belt. So this is how we can negotiate the urethral belt. But Second, uh, you, the sorry, sorry to interrupt, but during the RIRS surgery, the sheet will be there in the urethra and will be the draining. No. The uh, 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 yeah, yeah. Access sheet, uh, uh, you cannot, uh, 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 the outer sheet cannot be removed. I mean to say, VIU sheet cannot be removed. No, no. Either we can keep both half moon sheet as well as 21 French VIU sheet, but that becomes cumbersome because that is good yeah. to attach to So, what we usually yeah. do is we take out the 21 French sheet and we just keep half moon sheet intact. So, they raise the better as well, and uh, our purpose is solved to buy the sheet. Okay, okay. So next uh, difficult uh, thing is urethral curves. Now we many, many times come across this kind of stones which is stuck and then there are difficult curves possible and uh, you know, this will do it. Whichever guide work we try to do, whatever juggler we try to do, we fail to negotiate that thing. So the solution which we have, we all do this regularly, we instill air, saline, we instill okay, jelly, we can take the retrograde, semi-rigid URS and uh, take various guide wires starting from Thermo guide wire, zebra guide wire, or sensor guide wire. Last, uh, we can do a retrograde flexible URS. And at the last, we can have no option but to park integrally and do a semi retrograde URS from above. But when all solution fail, what we are left with is integrated flexible URS. So let me share you a small video. Now, this is the patient who had come uh, from Agra, having an upper erotic stone which was infected. We tried all the maneuver from below. We tried to put a uh, guide bar, this is to do an integrate puncture. Once we did an integrate puncture, we passed our flexible uh, URS through that urethral excess sheet, which was passed from the middle pustic calyx right into the upper ureter. And since semi-rigid URS was not able to reach there, we had to use this uh, uh, flexible URS. And with the help of that URS, we could reach the stone from the integrated approach. And subsequent story is quite simple. Use laser to you know, uh, break the stone and dust, it, dust the stone. And finally, we kept the stent and came out of this. But we kept this patient in very strong follow-up. We had to keep the suggestion for one and a half months. And then we did a check uh, URS. And that cow got settled down and there was no stricture. But these are the kind of patients who are likely to develop uh, stricture, not just because of the use of laser, but because of the stone being very, very infected. Uh, but you know, ultimately, it does get into the laser. So we need to be very careful and judicious in keeping this stand for long time in such patients. Rohit, it's interrupting. Yeah, yeah. Rohit, it's interrupting.
Hmm. Yeah, dear friends, uh, there's some uh, technical issue. Hope uh, it will not happen again and again. And uh, we will ask him to rejoin through the other net possible. Ureteral kink uh, in RARS is a uh, uh, RARS is a big subject. Uh, anybody who wants to do RARS juniors, please do. 6 by 7.5 French ureteroscopy with a guide wire. If you use the guide wire and if you go inside, if you see the upper ureter, it is safe. If you are not able to pass the guide wire, it is unsafe. So pass the guide wire, preferably pass the thick guide wire if it goes soft and into the kidney, you are very safe. And whenever you have uh, difficulty in passing the guide wire, uh, don't uh, lose the guide wire till the end. Use the safety access also. A lot of uh, Rohit. Rohit. Unmute. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if possible, use the other internet connection also. Uh, let's try. I'm changing that. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, I'm changing that. Can you see my slides now? Uh, yes, I am able to see. Uh, which yeah. uh, while maneuvering curve, we put little more irrigation. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So I am seeing at the audience questions, uh, people are joining. Uh, more yeah. people are joining. Already 58 have joined. So uh, continue, continue, please. You are talking about yeah. the and passing a flexible scope in the ureteroscopy. Uh, these are the maneuvers now. Now we are here exactly. Yeah. So now see. So whenever you know when we can't reach from retrograde across, we can uh, we can park from anterior. We can try a semi rigid URS. But at times you know the stone is in the gray area, not approachable with semi rigid URS. So that time we can pass a uh, urethral access sheet up uh, down up to the level of upper urethral, and then we can use our flexible URS also to reach to the stone and uh, dust the stone and get away with the situation. So, you know, at times, you know, it is not what you see, but it is how you see makes, you know, all the difference. So, uh, if, you, if you use our common sense, we can actually get through this. So, next thing, which is very important, uh, you know, in planning and executing your RIS is how to have your OR set. Now, this is something which we have, you know, uh, called as like ergonomy in the theater. So, let me explain to you what, what do we mean by that. We don't need any crisscross movements. We always keep in mind that if at all we can't uh, have a successful uh, RIRS, we need to be prepared for conversion to PERC. Our anesthetist as well as our assistant has to be able to watch the procedure because we need their active participation in performance of this procedure. A laser machine and fiber should be in close vicinity to us. Now let me show you uh, the theater scope. Can you see this, uh, uh, the photograph of the yes. operation theater? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so see, many a times I've seen people in workshop, you know, because, you know, in workshop, we are all in the foreign kind of, you know, entity and we don't have a control. But whenever I go for any workshop, I always make it sure that if you are operating on left side, everything should be on the left side of the, the patient. So if I'm sitting here, there is a left renal stone, I'm planning the left RIRS. The CM should be, IRTV should be in, in the middle. At the head level, next to the anesthesia should be your uh, uh, TV tower or your uh, medical monitor tower. On the right side, there has to be the CM. So... It's absolutely ergonomy. So if you're operating on the right side and seeing on left side, at times you feel very difficult and you're uncomfortable in the back of your mind. And this is the trolley and this is the assistant. And laser fiber comes somewhere here. So you can see what is happening in the, the scopy. You can see what is there in the CRM. And you can actually see or view your settings. So you don't need to turn around on the other side. So this side is absolutely free. Now, only problem in this, if at all you need to convert this patient into PC and then if you're not... Uh, Converse with supine PCNL, there will be problem because if at all this patient needs a PCNL, we have to turn it around, then there will be problems. So if you are comfortable with supine PCNL, if at all required, you can do in the same kind of uh, in the OT center. So this is what uh, we have devised. So even without asking me, my answer is in my assistant decide. If the stone is on the right side, everything should be on the right side. If the stone is on the left side, everything should be on the left side. So you have a kind of you know an alignment from your stone, patient, IIT, everything in the same alignment. So this is one thing which we need to do. Second thing is uh, we have devised a dedicated RIRS trolley. Now, this is a trolley where you know we have a, a very long kind of a removable uh, tray. 
wherein we can put all our RRS assembly together. We keep this as dry area. We keep this as a wet area. And you know, we have with the help with you know kind of uh, bio and all digital scopes where the connector needs to be kept dry. So we have devised this kind of a small cabinet underneath the table wherein all this you know the dry kind of you know uh, connector area can be stationed when we are uh, doing we are not not using this flexible scope. Again, you know this trolley has you know one stabilizer of this. This is a removable road which can be autoclaved, so it can fix and stabilize the laser fiber. On the other side, this is a removable road which can be autoclaved, which can be used to keep the, the wire. So we don't need to use all these mosquitoes to fix this thing. So this is in totality the RRS trolley, where even such a long kind of a trolley that we don't need to bend our flexible scope. Now, if you if you visit any gastro surgeon, they will have a vertical cabinet, wherein they will have all their uh, their gastroscope and colonoscope hanging vertically. So we also need not bend the scopes when we are not using it. And keep it, you know, in unbended fashion. So this is a trolley which we have devised and very comfortable. Very good, using very good. Trolley. I just want it one minute, one minute. It's a very good one. It's yes. a new thing. Yeah. Uh, one thing is that go back to the slide. What is this third yeah. uh, uh, third clip? Uh, uh, the trolley is uh, uh, a sterile trolley is kept in the on the uh, third one. Third. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So see, this is a basic trolley which has been draped using these sterile tapes, and this is a this is a trolley which is removable, which is autoclaved separately. So whenever oh. we use, we have three, four such trolley. So we take that autoclave and after draping the table, we, we keep over here and get fixed over here. So there is not much of a movement. And all the assemblies, for example, basket, pathfinder, excess sheets, and uh, flexible scope, they all remain there. Very good, very good. It has some sense and. Uh... The, the small uh, laser uh, holding point is also you have to you have to make it welding welding such type of uh, that is very useful no, because it, most of the yeah, times uh, laser fiber, even I am facing this I am facing laser contamination because technician will keep on the laser mission and then we have to take it uh, I feel that's a strong source of infection it's a good idea this correct. it's a very good correct. idea I must appreciate correct. this and trolley Thank you, keeping, one advantage is Whatever the instrument you pick up, that only will be used. The rest of the instruments will be sterile, and uh, later on need not be uh, wasted time for the this thing. But, uh, I, I don't Very know. Correct. First time I am seeing trolley keeping on the sterile trolley keeping on the with side X uh, um, or Paracer. Uh, some innovation. No, no. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that that you know because this by this digital scopes they have a connector. This connector you know cannot be immersed in side X. So that problem which you are facing was even if. Not maybe necessary not also. This... Connector at the end, not yeah. necessary also. But the head and every part which we are using, if it yes. is fine, good. This yeah. Is fine. Yeah. Please proceed. Thank you. So next, you know, this is all theoretic things. We are not going to discuss it too much, but we all need that. We need to have adequate imaging studies, hospital units, values, you know, counted at the different. Uh, the points have significant impact and uh, expecting how much time you will take for an uh, uneven full RIRS. Urine culture, it's a theoretical thing. It's a debatable question. I don't do urine culture every Rohit, time one before question, taking the question. One question here yeah. by the audience yeah. because yeah. it will be interesting always. Uh, 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 Vivek is one person who participates in pure and asks frequently questions relevant. He asked two questions. In your yeah. curve better, if uh, if you are uh, if impacted stone is there if curve is not negotiating if high pressure is used uh, does it rupture the pelvis why can't we use yeah yeah, yeah the second question he asked is uh, recently if you use the flexible scope slow weight they are floating he, he asked correctly if you use only flexible scope they will float on the and they will come up uh, so uh, i don't know whether you observe this or not i am see i have seen it i put uh, either one small artery forceps uh, on the uh, safer point and then it will dip down. Uh, they are light yeah. enough to float in the water. They are plastic actually. Uh, the, Absolutely. Uh, these two questions uh, asked by Vivek, can you address? Yeah. See, number one thing is, you know, I do not uh, believe in exerting too much of pressure because, you know, it can definitely rupture or it doesn't rupture. It can lead to significant uh, extravasation also. So I never use that much of pressure. I, I don't uh, get back to your uh, second question now. Uh, what do you want to you asking me is floating the flexible scope in uh, sterile tray it will float sometimes yeah yeah it will float but you know what we are doing is we, we keep it you know that the whole trolley the sterile trolley is filled with you know liquid so that it completely remains submerged into if you keep okay. only half of the trolley 
it can float but if you completely uh, you know uh, have a uh, almost 80% of the trolley filled with the liquid then it remains uh, there and then we have a uh, couple of cross pieces you know kept on that so that they can you know remain stable there otherwise yeah it does float, but enough. it doesn't create any problem yeah yeah, yeah. okay please don't mind uh, that that makes interaction sure. Absolutely. See, question answer. There is monologue never works. It's always a dialogue that works. So yes. I appreciate that and I look forward to it. Yeah. So all these are debatable. And if you're stuck here, probably we'll have endless discussion of that. So I'm just keeping for the sake of uh, thing. Patient positioning. One, once again, the same thing. We need to follow the ergonomy. Only thing is, uh, it is standard method of 45 still up so that patient doesn't have that much of pain afterwards. And this tilting can help a lot. If at all, for example, if you are dealing with the stone on the left side in the stone is in the pelvis so what you want is you don't want the fragments to go into the different calyces so what you do is you take his left flank up by 45 degrees or whatsoever fragment or dust to settle down in the in the pelvis itself but if at all your stone is in the calyx laterally on the left side then rather than keeping that flank up because you want to use the popcorn to this best effect so what you do is you do other way around uh, tilting the right side up so it depends on which location you're stone and then you can customize the patient position uh, to your benefit. Uh, same thing is if you're working in the upper calyx, uh, you prefer head down. And if you're working in lower calyx, you prefer head up. So these are the things which you gradually customize as you know, do not many cases. So choice of anesthesia, we all know that uh, either we can have an option of doing it in spinal. So this is the case which was done in spinal and you can appreciate all these respiratory excursions. This is URS and the problem is, you know, because you know, at times we don't know what time the, the inspiration is going to happen. So we can, you know, just hit in the center core of uh, the stone. So rather than that, if you have a general anesthesia with a very good anesthetist who knows and who actually sees the procedure and he can actually, you know, give you a pause the 45 to 60 seconds of complete apnea and you are at, at complete mental peace and there is hardly any moment you can appreciate here. And you can uh, use your paintbrush technique and you can actually carve the stone, but you know, you make sure your anesthetist is well versed with this and we have an uh, anesthesia monitor which measures ETCO2 and our target is to keep the ETCO2 not beyond 52 and that is what is important in our case. So you need a very good anesthetist who comes to you regularly. Same thing whether we are doing URS or whether you are doing RIRSC. Uh, here, if uh, we are using for this patient, you know, spinal anesthesia, we never have any control on patient's excursions. In spite of telling them or convincing them that you know, please take a uh, kind of slow inspiration, you know, at the very, time, very, you know, you do not appreciate it. Suddenly there is a jerk and you can go deep and you can have a clenching effect on the relation mucosa. But at the same thing, if we can, you know, use a general anesthesia with a complete apnea, we are at absolute peace and we can actually carve the stones without any undue uh, movements or any retropulsions. So there is no uh, kind of, you know, any, any fear of uh, touching the calation mucosa and producing a blanching effect. So, uh, yeah, at least so in the early people. part of our career, we should prefer general anesthesia to have a comfort and to avoid any mucosal age. Uh, accessories, uh, we will deal with this many accessories, guide wires, access sheets, baskets, connectors, irrigation system. Uh, a lot of things have been uh, said about guide wire. Initially, people were, you know, uh, having that if you don't have by wire, you can't do an RRS. But then gradually, once you use them, you know that, you know, anything of this is working fine, whether it's stereo by wire or sensor guide wire. To me, everything is same. I hardly use sensor. I always use terrible wire and unless I have to backload it without any excess sheet. The size initially, I was using 0 0.035, but you know, I, I do keep on reusing this guide wire. So I have no problem in accepting this in open fora. Yeah, we do reuse and when you reuse, these guide wires have a tendency to swell. So it is preferable to use a little smaller, either 0 0.032 or 0 0.025 terrible guide wire. So that even if they swell by repeated use, it doesn't cause any problem. And the uh, third thing is, what is the indication to place access sheet or to black the plexi scope? And uh, whether do you reuse or you use and is disposable? These are the uh, factors which can influence your choice. As I earlier stated, I always use Terumo guide wire, sensory wire, only when I am uh, backloading without the access sheet because it doesn't slip off. It has a stiff uh, kind of, you know, thing. It supports your uh, force. So that is the only uh, uh, situation when I'm using sheathless flexible flexiscopy, we use this sensor guide one. Now, it would like sheet. There are a couple of like questions which we all uh, face many times. Why to use? Which one to use? What diameter do we use? What length do we use? Let's address them. 
we all know that these are the the advantages of the flexa sheet it allows multiple reentry it allows easy access the irrigation flow is better the ipp intrapelvic pressure is uh, very well controlled and there is no need for any better drainage there are certain questionable uh, or debatable uh, advantages like it decreases operative time and it, and it uh, influences overall stone free rate which are having questionable things there are different uh, articles available in literature but my personal experience is i always tend to use your lexa sheet ha huh? but if it doesn't go it doesn't uh, need me to put a stent and come out we always try to do sheetless uh, flexible scopy So which one to use now? We have different companies. We are not going to have any commercial discussion. But now there are three categories: conventional, a safety wire access sheet, and a suction access sheet. So there are too many choices, and we are confused at times. But you know, my my thing is, you know, we always go with the conventional access sheet, which can be either a cook or a rocket. And then this is a safety wire access sheet. Whenever you know you are uh, having a doubt that you might lose an access, it is better to have a safety wire. The way we have a PCNL, so this is a kind of Safety wire, you know, takes a sheet. There is a you know uh, sleeve through which the wire goes, and we take out everything. The wire stays inside. We can do RGP. We can advance the flexiscope with the wire always there. So even if there is you no know, some uh, some some mishap occurs during the conduct of this uh, flexiscopy, our safety is always uh, there. Now the new thing is section unit flexiscope sheet. Now uh, it has got a connector, Y connector at one end, and then there is a small uh, vacuum kind of uh, bottle which is there. uh i didn't i have a couple of uh, this kind of sheet but i don't uh, personally use it much after the uh, the switching over of my practice from whole beam to full beam because the kind of dust which we get and kind of dust that i see uh draining down on its own i have never felt a need to use this uh you would like say sheet which is having the possibility of doing a suction at the same time but still you know the future will have uh, its say about uh, its usability but for now a big no for my side now which size to use uh, if we are using non digital or the fiber optic flexiscope we can use 9.5 by 11 french but if you are using digital one then you need 10.7 by 12.7 just one thing drainage and intra pelvic pressure is directly proportional with the size different between the scope and the your next sheet same thing what we do in mini park or micro park where you know between the size and the scope if there is not significant gap is there we don't get uh, good irrigation neither we get a good drainage so we need to have a little difference little space between these two for allowing uh, egress of the irrigation fluid and some dust with size to use pediatric population 13 cm females 28 cm and male 35 cm i see lot of questions being asked to the various mentors and public fora and conferences that sir where do we keep our upper end of the flex sheet i find it quite funny to me we need to use a shortest length possible that would traverse the uvj because my intention Personally, is only to traverse the UVJ so that I don't have to uh, face any problem in entering into that urethral tension. But you know, I don't see any logic in keeping it mid urethral, upper urethral. No, for me, just traverse the UVJ. And if you use too long a sheet, for example, in a female, if you are using 45 centimeter length, a lot of length of urethral like sheet will remain outside the urethra. And at many times, even keeping that length outside urethra, your flexiscope will not be able to reach to upper calyx. So use the shortest length possible. And our uh, case will be through. Uh, coming to baskets now, there are several baskets are there. Uh, I personally feel one thing which we should never use is any basket which is having a long tip because we are working in a very uh, narrow pelvic elastic system, so there is not much space for any tip. So never use that. Whatever we use, either it's a tipless engage or it's a tipless end circle. Now, what to use when? Let me sh uh, show this. The distance between this flange of the engage. and the end circle uh, tells me that whenever i need to retrieve the fragments from pelvic elastic system down to your across ureter to outside we use end circle and whenever we need to relocate a stone from say about lower calyx to upper calyx that is when we use engage but if you try to uh, retrieve a fragment using this engage the the distance between this flanges it will not accommodate uh, while you take it you know out entirely through the your next sheet so If you retrieve, you use end circle, relocate, use engage. This is as simple as that. We all know this connector. This was there when we used uh, fiber optic uh, non-digital flexiscopes. And these are different kinds of uh, sealers available, which allows you know uh, irrigation channel and there is a sealing effect by rotational movement. These things are available right now in plastic. 
we have customized one metallic one which can be reused and the uh, recurrent expenses can be brought down so that is we are comfortable with now irrigation systems first of all we need uh, why do we need irrigation one to clean the collecting system second to increase the flow and to enhance our vision so these are the basic aim of uh, using an irrigation system let me tell you a uh, higher flow directly culminates into a better vision and the performance of our our scope becomes better and if you are not using any sheet the irrigation flow is increased by 30 to 85% if you use sheet so that is the advantage of using a sheet and when you deflect the scope for example from pelvis to lower calyx in the vitro if you see the flow will reduce directly by 50% if you keep an instrument a basket or laser fiber the flow will be reduced by 70% and having a basket or a laser fiber in the flexible scope and then you deflect it to access the lower pole the flow will be reduced by more than 95%. So you'll be working only with 5% of flow. So at that point of time, gravity won't help. So you will need some irrigation system at that point of time. Let me show you one case which we do today. This is the case which was having a PCM because of a renal failure. And we tried to do a flexi scope. And you know, the moment we were there in the pelvis, it hardly distended because the PCM tube was open. So it was not distending the pelvic irrigation system. The moment we kept, you know, a blocker, at the end of PCM tube, there was a distension of pelvic elation uh, system and we could see all the stones very easy. So this is why irrigation is required to keep our vision uh, very good. And, uh, but mind well, uh, we need irrigation, but we don't need pressure irrigation. If at all, by using thulmium, now we see a sense from effect, you know, we dust and you know, the dust is roaming around here and there. At that point of time, our assistant out of good faith, he come, you know, pushes more irrigation, but you know, we don't need to do that. What we need is to have a little patience after, say, about a minute or two, all the dust settles down and the vision becomes uh, automatically better. So at that point of time, never use pressure irrigation system. These are my choices. Either I use a 50 ml syringe with an extension tubing or I use a pathfinder. But pathfinder I use only when I have that particular assistant who is uh, acclimatized and who is, knows my practice and who knows uh, you know, when to have a you know, little bit of irrigation or not. So otherwise, I always use this. Uh, pressure bag, a big no. So manual pressure should never be done because it leads to uncontrolled pressure rise and it can lead to, we all know what happens to intrapelvic pressure. Now coming from irrigation system to intrapelvic pressure, uh, yeah, the safe limit for the intrapelvic pressure is 30 millimeter of mercury. And if we use equation of 1.36 uh, times H2O is equal to one mercury, the 40 centimeter is the height of irrigation uh, we need to have from the level of pubic synthesis. And this is why uh, the upper limit has been set up to 40 centimeter of H2O. Uh, if you use too much of you know, irrigation, it leads to exponential rise in IPP. So even if you have a pressure bag, you know, the moment you squeeze the pressure bag, even if you release it, there will be continued rise in the IPP. So uh, even if you don't push it anymore, the rise will continue for a while. And that leads to, we all know, significant uh, Pylovenous, pylolymphatic, and all this backflow, septicemia, and extravasations. So, internal reflux in formation rupture needs to be prevented by judicious use of irrigation systems. Plexiscope. Now, these were the factors previously to decide the choice of the plexiscope. We used to consider the size of the scope, image quality, working channel, flexibility, longevity, and durability. But it boils down to now only one question whether to use a digital or to use a fiber optic scope. Now, if we calculate the size of the scope, I need to caution all of you, whatever size they mention, that doesn't apply to the entire length of scope. What they mentioned is just the tip of that particular flexi scope. So they claim the, the size of the digital scope is 7.5 inch, but that's only at the tip. It's not right at the base. And that's why we need to use 10.7 by 12.7 French uh, UFX sheet while using our digital flexi scopes. Now let's see the image quality. This is a four or five years old uh, video clip, which was uh, which I did with Flex X2, and we see the vision. And uh, on the right side, this is the uh, flexiscope in done using uh, BioRes MD scope, and we all can appreciate. We all agree that you know the vision is definitely more uh, if we compare between digital and fiber optic. And this uh, vision helps a lot in identifying small mucosal abnormality as well as making sure there is a complete stone clearance. So digital is the way to go, and it is the way forward to have a complete stone clearance. Recently, we have seen some excellent vision in the Flexus C1 scope, 
but i'm i'm not personally use it neither i know about the cost effectiveness so i'll keep my my fingers crossed regarding uh, that until then i'm good with this my in these scopes working channel now the size of the working channel hardly matters now because now we are having a very dusting a very good quality dusting based on like aluminum fiber so what matters to us is the the entry of in the flexus 2 it used to 9 pm and flexus it was 3 pm now bavarad has come with two different kind of scopes or either you can choose is 11 o'clock entry or you can choose a 2 o'clock entry now this does make a sense i'll i'll show you one example now this particular uh, stone which we were trying to do with the the bavarad scope having an entry or a channel at 11 o'clock so we could easily debug this stone but it was very difficult and there was a significant torque coming while reaching to that particular stone down there in the calyx but same thing when we used 2 o'clock uh, entry uh, flexi scope we could easily reach to that stone so it's always better if you are having any multiple scopes better have one 11 o'clock and one 2 o'clock so it can help you uh, in choosing a scope and you can not reach with one kind of scope flexibility on any day flexibility of tip is more with fiber optic than digital there is no second thought so i still have flexus 2 in my armamentarium i hardly use it but you know there is a day when you know i cannot access lower pole uh, i always take that particular scope out and it has it has saved many days for me and i could still reach to the lower pole using my flexus 2 scope and now uh, if you see the flexibility now this this scope is flexus 2 and these are all powered digital scopes now you can yourself say this is a significantly less flexible body than the flexus 2 and this is I, i keep on saying that many times so that you know that uh, any day flexus 2 is not going to go out of my eye because one fine day when my digital scope will not be able to reach a difficult over pole i always will be able to use this scope and that's why it still has a merit in uh, my particular armament for our eye longevity yes this was the scope which i'm having it has got uh, what now 20 or 22 dots but this is 5 years uh, old scope it has served more than 600 cases so i am i'm very happy with that and this is the the digital flexi scope uh, which was third one from the bavarad which uh, lasted for 114 cases uh, these people don't have the time restriction now so even after 114 cases the vision was excellent and uh, it was very very satisfactory not the vision even at the, at the end of that i could see the bending property the flexibility of tip was still same as it was there when i started using it so this scopes really last well if you take good care of them and the longevity is not at all fashionable now coming to the laser machines now we all have this debate whether it's holmium or it is thulmium i have access fortunately to both this is a 100 watt laser which i'm having since last 12 years and this is with me for last 2 years uh this is a debate between holmium and thulmium so if we go into theory uh, we all know the wavelength but the thing is the absorption coefficient 31 against 129 four times less and opd is 0.314 mm as against 0.077 mm it culminates into a usually better dusting efficiency uh, in favoring pfl over holmium beyond that we have the pulse energy setting which can be from a uh, point 2 to 6 joules whether in tfl we can have as low as 0.025 and uh, whenever we need to have a dusting efficiency we need to have a very low joules and uh, reasonable frequency so there tfl helps even the frequency it gives supra physiologic frequency we don't need 2200 but usually we settle on between uh, 5 to 50 and the pulse duration and pulse profile is also favoring tfl over holmium so these are all theoretical advantages uh having a tfl overhaul vm it really has an impact in overall battery dust quality as compared to the holmium if you use holmium these are the settings for me now there are two different goals if your goal is uh, rrs or in uh, urs or micro perk your goal is pulverization i mean mini perk or and you know mini piece signal your goal is uh, fragmentation so if we uh, restrict ourselves only for the stone dusting or the pulverization my setting will be a low energy so this is what we used to use in holmium laser we no more use this in the stone we still use it for the nucleation of prostate and these are the tfl settings which are given by company you know these are the settings which has uh, led to all this you know uh, blah blah of uh, ureteral stitches because these are the setting which has been customized by them tomorrow if you buy a laser uh, this is the setting uh, which will by default come into a screen 
You select kidney, you select this thing, and the energy will be 0.50, and your frequency will be 50, and they will have 25 watts. And same thing in popcorning, you will have 125 watts. We don't use this. And that is what I want to caution all of those who are, who are, who are into this TFL, that you, know, you always have your customized setting for your own goal. And what uh, Chandra is, you know, I know his preference, you know, very workshops we discuss. He always uses for dusting one joule and six hertz, and he uses six watts. Same thing. I also use six watts, but I use 0.40 joule and 15 hertz. That's an individual preference. Both works well, but make sure uh, in curator or uh, probably in kidney, when you contemplate an RRS, we should uh, intend not to go beyond six or at the max 10 watts, because I have done a study where uh, we have measured the irrigation fluid temperature and the uh, the irrigation backflow temperature and if you use too high a frequency the temperature of the food that comes out as a drainage is significantly high and that heat is what is causing all the damage so let us see how uh, one joule works here so this is the setting which is like one joule of energy and six is frequency the only problem which i see is the early part of that thing you know uh, even if accidentally if you touch the stone there will be kind of a blast effect and you feel like, you know, there is a bit of uncontrolled kind of a fragmentation. At least I see that uh, on my side. But, you know, when I use a uh, setting which I have found myself comfortable with this 0.15 by 40, so the stone hardly moves, there is no retropulsion, and you can actually carve the stone, and you can actually pinpoint which part of the stone you want to dust. And uh, that is what has, you know, made me comfortable. So I still use 0.15 by 40. Six words, and I have a hardly face any problems of any heat, really, uh, damage, or any stitches. Coming to fibers, yes, we were using 365, we came down to 270, 220, 200, and 150 microns. First time Chandra used 150 microns in Ahmedabad in AIE, then I used these 150 microns at Faridabad in his workshop. And uh, in fact, uh, the fiber, there's a question, uh, in fact, there's a question that same, uh, irrigation flow is better, Rohit? the flexibility is better, Rohit? the retropulsion effect is less. Rohit? So I think days are coming that, you know, even we'll, we'll go still further down from 150 to 100 or maybe 50 microns. Rohit? This is possible only with the thulmium fiber laser. It's not possible for holmium Rohit? because the holmium generator, there are four generators which gives a collimated beam of laser and then they focus into fiber, wherein the thulmium fiber laser, there is a single diode generator. And this is originating from a kind of a fiber level and transmitting it through the fiber level. So we can still go down. And if we still go down, we can still have a smaller accessory channel and then we can still uh, have a low profile uh, flexible uricoscope so that we can just walk in. We don't need any dilatation. We don't need any access sheet. But we can uh, do sheetless uh, flexiscopy more and more. Laser fibers. Yes, uh, this is an example, a small video, uh, quite old video. There was a lower calyx stone, and we were trying at that point of time using 365. And because of torque, it was not able to you know, target the, the portion of stone. And rather than that, it was actually touching the mucosa. So we changed over from uh, 365 to 200 microns, and it allowed more flexibility. And uh, with that 200 micron, this stone in the lower calyx, lower calyx could be accessed, and uh, we could uh, pinpointly dust it and uh, achieve a complete clearance. So lesser the size of the fiber, better is the flexibility. That is the take home message. Now coming back to some tricks of trade, whenever you get a new flexiscope, always do this. This is a leak test. We, I don't know how many of you do it. I personally do it whenever I get, so this is a pressure which is set at 19. And you see a few air bubbles are coming out. So this air bubbles are coming out. That is indicating that there is some perforation across any length of the uretroscope. And if you carefully look at the, the pressure gauge, the pressure starts declining. So if this is there, that means that the scope is not a new one. It's not a, uh, it's a damaged one. So beware of using the scope. Second thing, whenever you buy any new scope, though they are of same make and you know same company, always try to see how much is the flexibility of the tip. This is an 11 uh, o'clock entry level scope. And this is the two o'clock entry scope. Now you see how much distance remains between the the band and how much uh, distance remains here. So this, this scope, both of the scope were from the same company, but I feel this was far better as far as the flexibility was concerned. And this was having a little bit rigidity. So whenever you buy a new scope and before starting using these scopes, always open those scopes, perform a leak test, perform this thing in, in presence of the engineers and then only start using it. Uh, we all know this, uh, 
uh, a common trick that you know we used to basket a stone from lower calyx to upper calyx, and we have an IIT view and we have an uh, endo uh, view. This was a uh, flexes too. Reason why I'm I'm putting this video is that you know now people have uh, different techniques to relocate the stone, and this is a very glamorous technique. Let me show you. Many mentors, you know, they talk about it. That you know they are using this fiber. And with the help of fiber, they drill the stone and reach 1.1, this kind of a small hole, they push the stone. And here I have pushed the stone from pelvis to the upper calyx. But uh, I, have, I have faced a uh, downside of this. Uh, the laser fiber, like 200 micron fiber, is not that strong. It is, it is not mean to, you know, relocate a stone. So what happens is, you know, after you do that, uh, laser fiber becomes weak, not at the tip, but you know, somewhere just proximal to the tip and you can never know that thing and you fire the laser and somehow you see that stone fragmentation or stone dusting is not occurring and then you advance the fiber and take it out and then you see there is a some bend in the laser fiber and at that time you have already fired that laser and this, this is what you get. This is a relocation injury happening to the, the tip of the flexible scope. And after this happens, your scope is hardly a case or two away from getting non-functional. So let's not try that. It's very glamorous, but you know it doesn't serve the purpose. We have baskets for that. We can use that. Now, uh, there are people who say that I don't need basket. I also initially was thinking the same thing, but you know, then two cases taught me that no, basket is always there. Uh, one thing is with basket, the flexibility is more than the laser fiber. This is a 200 micron fiber. I'm approaching a difficult uh, lower pole angulation. So initially I was able to hit the stone, but then I could not bend it more. So every time I was trying to fire a laser, I was getting this mucosa damage. So then I tried a lot of tricks. We used to you know, have an irrigation, just have a chunk of irrigation so that it pumps out uh, into a favorable calyx. Nothing worked. And finally I had to change it over and uh, take my basket. And with the help of this uh, basket, I uh, took that stone and then relocated this stone into a more favorable calyx. So baskets are always valuable. And uh, whether with TFL, people say it's a very good dusty laser. We hardly retrieve any factor. But still, once in a while you come across such difficult stones, wherein the basket will save a day for you. The rest of the thing is pretty straightforward. We dust it and then finish the case. There are people who say, throw away your baskets. No ways. This is one example. This was a to the wing commander uh, from you know one of the army uh, officer and he want, he he was facing a medical examination and he had this precisely seven stones and what he wanted was a complete clearance not even a dust so what we did was we never tried to dust that stone we individually picked all the stones with the help of basket and uh, with seven uh, in and out the goes we removed and we shared this uh, video with him so that they can reproduce this. And then uh, we got a sonography and CT scan. Since we didn't dust at all and uh, removed all the fragments, all the stones intact, there was no question of any residual. So yes, baskets are there. They are very, very valuable part of our armor bacterium. And uh, once in a while, they can you know do the job for us. Now, many times we see that, you know, it's the respiration excursion that leads to the problem. But, you know, let me show you one very interesting thing. This is a general anesthesia. And you see the movement. This movement is not of respiration. This is the movement of the renal pedicle. And you see there is a constant pulsatile movement. And uh, though there is not of significant uh, movement like respiratory excursion, uh, you see it's quite uncomforting for us. And you know, every time there is a you know, kind of a pulsatile movement of the stone and it uh, diverges in attention and at times you feel very very uncomfortable so this is the case where we had to relocate the stone into the upper calyx and once the stone was pushed in upper calyx practically it was like steel and there was no pulsatile effect and you could uh, paint the, the the stone and actually you could write your own name because you, know, you can write whatsoever you want to write and that is the control which you get when there is no untoward movement so this is so whenever we come across such stone in the pelvis and there is a pulsatile effect, we can always uh, try to look at the stone into the lower calyx and have a very uh, peaceful uh, uh, conduct of the flexible arrows. So coming back to the things which we started, 10 commandments, if you follow all these 10 commandments very, very rigorously and religiously, I think our journey to RRS will be uncomplicated and without any problem. Uh, so let us ask ourselves the question again, is it an art or science? 
let me tell you with the basic end of your skills and a background experience of semi rigid urs more than 90% of rrs cases can very well be managed the problem is only those 10% cases where you need some technical innovations and out of box thinking but don't chase those 20 cases 20% cases it's a journey so if you know conduct all these 90% cases gradually we will all adopt we will all gather that uh, skill to handle that 10% cases many times in workshop in conference are you know mentors they focus on this 10% cases and and you know that we always remain you know kind of a uh, uh, baffled that you know, 10% cases come to us what will happen but no our focus should be on 90% cases and that's why i tell it is a common sense if we do 90% of cases correctly there's 10% cases are only a matter of time learning curve in rrs i told you before it's a big myth yes there is a learning curve in pcnl there is a learning curve in supine pcnl there is a learning curve in inucleation of prostate i don't see any learning curve in rrs because uh, what you can do is you can treat all your urs as rrs there are patients who are what turning up frequently as urs you forget you have any sort of see like rheumatic you forget you have triprong or travel force if you treat those urs as rrs that will build a volume you should have a team approach two or three of you can jointly do that one performs the other one sees and guides or criticizes so that is what can help you and good volume of cases at reasonable frequency that is what is required to flatten this learning curve and uh, one opportunity which we all have is that we can always have this post urs or post pcnl stent removal cases these are our initial rrs cases so let's not hurriedly do remove them in local anesthesia center let's always do it under short general anesthesia Take the stent out, you know. Do a gentle, flexible uh, ureteroscopy. Understand the calcium anatomy. Understand your finger movements. Understand your wrist movements, and all that. And these are the cases that can uh, help you adopting this skill of RRS faster. And even if now, even if doing that, you have any problem in this kind of uh, RRS uh, things, uh, we are always uh, welcome to class. See, this is some module which we are conducting every two, three months. Fifteen urologists come and hone their skills. just rrs in education these rrs uh, uh, and micro pcnls and supine pcnls and yes god is kind to us our center has been accredited by european society of india for a fellowship for observership for three months so we all learn to disseminate knowledge we don't learn to give knowledge to ourselves so dissemination is what required we learn by uh, passing over the knowledge and that's what makes us uh, grow uh, i will be happy to uh, answer any questions and before i Jump to that thing, Chandra. This yeah. is all about an amateur science. This is 2023, and me being MBA, I think the next in the series, a uh, season two should be RRS commerce. And someday we will definitely discuss the commercial aspects of RRS, which is actually a big hindrance uh, for you know adopting this RRS in uh, routine urology practice. Over to you, Chandra, for any questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Am I audible? Am I audible? Am I audible? Am I audible? Hello, Vivek. I'm speaking. I'm not audible to you. Hello. Here. Who is here? Hello, Vivek. Am I audible? I can't hear you, Chandra. you can't you, you 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 are listening you are listening hello 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 you can hello can you hear me chandra i can hear you I, you are not able to hear hello, hello? i can i can he, i can hear you but i am not able you are not able to hear me uh, put off or increase the volume or whatever it may be i was asking questions also uh, come out of the come out of the uh, if possible speakers Okay, I can hear you now. Ah, uh, that's all. You are you are able to hear? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's crystal clear, Chandra. Okay. Go ahead. Now, uh, some of the questions are asked. We will finish that. Uh, yeah. Uh, thing is, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes you get snowstorming effect when you are doing a large storm. It will obscure. 
uh, what will you do in that time? Section so far is not established and no, in future it may come. But what will you do to have vision in the midst of dust, that is no storm? Yeah, uh, with the uh, dusting efficiency which TFL brings into picture, you know, this kind of snowstorm effect is there, especially when you're treating a large volume storm, by the time you finish 50% of the storms, they are a lot of dust. So what we need to do is do not do a pressure irrigation, just wait for a while, give yourself uh, 50 to 20 seconds or 30 seconds and all dust gets settled down. And at that time, if possible, you can relocate the stones to different calyx or different uh, anatomy, and then you can get rid of those dust. And one more thing, Chandra, many times, if not just the, the, the uh, gravels or the stone dust, but at the time, there is a coagulum kind of stone uh, yes. getting formed. Yes. This coagulum, you know, this is very difficult. Thing. It's very difficult to get rid of that. Many times, I have seen uh, post-RIRS, uh, that kind of a coagulum blocking your ureter, even with the stand. So we need to be very careful about it. Uh, the 150 micron fiber, do you think that it will bend uh, in a difficult situation better than 200? I have seen uh, three cases wherein I had started using 200 micron and then uh, it could not go. So then I switched show to basket and then somehow the basket got damaged in that case. So I had no option but to try 150 micron. And then with the help of 150 micron, I could relocate the stone. But the only problem with 150 micron is with the channel so big and 150 micron so small, it keeps on dangling. So even if you know you have an access where you, know, you can get an entry from 11 o'clock, you will see suddenly the fiber comes at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock. So if you by any chance misfire that particular uh, fiber, it will lead to injury. So whenever you use 150 micron, you be, be, be cautious about the dangling. Okay. So, uh, that's all about the, I'm just seeing the questions. Uh, if, if, if you have to use 12, 12 by 14 by chance for large stone, and uh, do you dilate or do you stent? Uh, for example, uh, if, I, if I take a case and if, uh, why would I, I use 12 by 14? I usually, I would not use 12 by 14 unless until the patient is a pre -stented. So my choice would be, to use 10.7 by 12.7 to use my digital taxi scope. 12 by 14, I use only when there is a pre-stented patient, wherein I can be sure that it negotiate easily and it will have a better uh, irrigation. I also agree. Otherwise, uh, don't use 12 by 14 and large stone uh, do PCNL. And uh, just uh, if you are really crazy about the large stone, then stent and then pre-stented only do it. Uh, all these things uh, uh, better not to dilate and experiment with the ureter primary for doing one Very correct. About two hours. <laughs> What is the longest duration you recommend RIR is one hour, one and a half hour? Very clear. State I, pers I personally, I personally say sixty minutes is my time. If it's not uh, getting completed in sixty minutes, then you know I'll, I'll uh, automatically convert it to supine procedure. No, I also agree. I don't want to. If I feel also that it will take more than one hour, convert. Even one so hour. I have one hour doing and doing supine PCL itself itself is really matters. First in the 15 minutes only, you will get idea that something I am doing uh, not correct. Quickly do RGP and do usually large stones are easy in PCNL. Somehow you get into the good calyx and then take it out. And don't unnecessarily, uh, there are articles, but more than three centimeters, especially volume high. Uh, it's not worth uh, doing long time RIRS. Kidney will become edematous. So I agree. I cannot agree more. The only thing is that's what I keep telling to, you know, urologists who come to me that, you know, you should learn RIRS from somebody who is not a bad part surgeon. Because most of the articles which come for such large volume stones, if you check the credentials of them, probably they are not that good a part surgeon. So that, you know, for them, it is not a choice. It is by lack of choice, they have to finish the job. And secondly, Chandra, I have worked out an equation that, you know, uh, where we factor in the house units, the length and the breadth of the stone. And then we use the, the approximate wattage which we're going to use. And then we can anticipate how much time. For example, if there is a stone of 15 by 12 millimeter, we don't go for 3D CT every time. So in a two-dimensional CT, if there is a 15 by 12 millimeter stone, that becomes 100, 1,800. And then we multiply it by how thick So if it is 1,000, so it becomes, you know, uh, 180000. Then we divide it by 6. Yeah, my wattage is 6. So that comes, last, to, yeah, that comes uh, to 30 minutes. Yes, yes, correct. Volume is more important uh, than the diameter uh, and uh, the breadth and length. See, one uh, last three questions, uh, some tricky questions. What is the worst, uh, worst experience in your uh, uh, RIRS uh, journey? 
very recently there was a patient who was having you know a, a stone in a very narrow calyx and we tried to poke that calyx the stone was visible we had somehow not been able to to do the fiber we to this basket basket uh, could uh, grasp the stone but when we tried to take it out there was a torrential bleeding from that particular uh, the edge of the calyx calyceal wall and it was really frightening the stone we took it out entirely and then when we looked at you know the, the receiving end of access sheet it was bleeding like there was an heavy fissure so we were all frightened but uh, god is god was kind to us and just we kept her registered observe her for a couple of you know uh, hours in icu and then things got settled torrential bleeding can occur but for short period of time because the fiber may not injure yeah. much my second question tricky question uh patient gets fever uh after the rirs you cleared completely you told that same day care discharge next day morning discharge you change to piptaj piprasil and tajabactam sorry and uh, next day you change to mirupenam high grade fever high count normal young patient fourth day high grade fever with tlc raised you used three antibiotics i need not say what i am using you change to third higher antibiotic what will you do ah uh, in this case thankfully we don't conduct us uh, one such case but whenever it such case happens i personally feel steroids have a big role to play because you know we get endothelial endothelial test you know such patients if the endothelial levels are very high you know they are the markers of sepsis at times the fever is not because of the sepsis even if the count is high you do not change over antibiotic you have a good drainage you give them a couple of shots of steroids we have seen couple of patients like this and they settle down without changing over to the antibiotics and uh, taking out the the any foreign body third or third day things got settled down i don't keep on changing antibiotics like this for us antibiotics is one shot of ciprofloxacin and uh, next day onwards it's pure fluoroquinolones for 3 to 5 days that's it okay last question uh what uh, will be the future guess in 2033 the picture of rirs chandra this was the year when you know first time the urology seats kept vacant in india so the kind of you know uh, population of urologists we are seeing you know kalsi modi sir every every uh, you know district or town palace will have urologists so i see myself as i'll be retired by 2033 and let the younger generation take over and do whatever they do because you know i don't see a very very good <laughs> i am not over. asking how vivek <laughs> how uh, but how but rohit rohit will be what yeah. is the breaking <laughs> scope <laughs> but i i i how the rrs will be in 2033 yeah. i know it will be done by many people i know it will be done for appropriate cases but what is your imagination in next uh, 10 years rrs technological advancement See, i i i feel and forget about rrs you think anything i feel by next 10 years everything probably most of the things in medical practice is going to be taken over by ai with the help of ai you will be able to predict the stone fragmentation with the help of ai you will be predicting the the ureter is it accommodated or not and i think ai will take over most of the the practical point in the coming 5 to 10 years so ai based you know robotic yeah. taxi urs will i, I strongly agree that an excellent talk Uh, to be honest uh, ai in the form of china recently one surgeon senior surgeon has shown that a one small uh, one small uh, grain without any connections outside mm. will enter the urethra bladder ureter and go inside sit on the stone it illuminates it produces laser it's uh, it uh, it uh, produces so powder and then come out through the urethra again back to your pocket He has shown that it's a pen. you 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 seen the video. I have the video. I was planning to keep it at the last, but not, I have to not, uh, not that is uh, possible, my dear friends. So technology, a technique, uh, converting to the benefit of the patient is science. So with this uh, message, he has clearly narrated various steps of RIRS procedures that established ninety nine percent what he said. I am doing. he is uh, literally gone into the controversies also and dogmatic statements are also i am agreeing that laser fiber you cannot dig it as a less strength he is intelligent he is, is scientifically like a science master he is telling this lacne this lacne they are very correct and very few cases you need to have the laser fibers on both the sides he has shown clearly 
and uh, uh, definitely spinal anesthesia even to date some people say but uh, if you are less experienced general anesthesia is better and he also mentioned in the last slide that future cost he has not spoken because it may not be a correct forum and uh, future i am thinking that if flexible digital comes less than 10000 rupees indian uh, then all this uh, all these government schemes uh, will uh, we, the people will be happy to accept rirs even for 40000 in that you can say definitely you you know i got the lowest cost scope from us is 22000 that means okay. it is in near future that less than 10000 you will get like oppo phone this also without any connection uh, wireless and monitor Bluetooth, yeah. that then you can use that again you will use that for 10 cases that means only 1000 rupees per scope then if you are paid 30 35000 also it is possible i am not joking possible. this is going to be the future we, india is a developing country where lot of uh, poor urologists are there poor patients are also there um the stones are also decreasing in size so this art will definitely convert into science big science and i am a strong believer for irs and uh, i thank once again for giving uh, such a nice talk and it will be remembered and this youtube link will be remembered and more than 135 audience have attended that's a good number in the recent past thank you very much uh, rohit all the best thank and you. if possible thank you, thank you so much one enucleation also we'll do after 6 months